Well, good morning, Journey Church. How are you feeling today? Hey, y'all, I'm Pastor Adrian. If we've never met before, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And it is such a privilege to be bringing you the Word of God this morning. Uh, it, it never gets old. And neither does the process leading up to a Sunday. I promise you that God has been dealing with me in a practical way because, like, I feel like I'm preaching to myself because this is going to be good, right? This is going to be really good. You know, Pastor Adam talked about healing. And it's just ironic that joy, which we're going to be talking about today, heals. Do you believe that? Especially in this Christmas season. Man, let me just get right to it because I got a lot to say and I feel like the Lord's going to do something. Does God desire for you to be happy or joyful? That's a trick question. He wants you to be both. And some of y'all are like, there's no way. There's no way. But yes, if you read through scripture, there is tons of scripture talking about rejoicing in the Lord, singing happy songs. Like God as a father, right, wants you to be happy. Just like who are our parents in here? You want your kids to be happy, don't you not? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. But man, even more than God's desire for you to be happy is he wants you to exceed with joy. Why? Why does he want you ex to exceed with joy, especially during this Christmas season? You see, God's saying, hey, I don't want to give you temporary happiness because happiness is fleeting, right? It comes and goes. Happiness is dictated to you by circumstance. It's external. Let me give you an example. You get the brand new iPhone 13, which I did, and suddenly it doesn't work. I'm literally angry. How many of you get hangry when you're hungry? And then food hits your stomach and you're, you're feeling good. They get your order wrong, it's a bad day. Happiness is dictated by circumstances, not under your control. But see, joy is something completely different. See, joy... Joy is immovable. It's constant. See, after you go through this Christmas season, you put all the decorations away, your, your new toys become old toys, and all your family is gone, man, you just go back to the old rhythms of life. Happiness is never meant to be sustainable. That's why if you're going to have an even better Christmas, you got to have joy. And see, I see a lot of people, man, during this Christmas season or just in this season of life, you see, you're trying to find joy and you're looking for it in all the wrong places, so you settle for happiness. Oh, man, I'm getting started. Let's go. See, I'm here to remind you. God's desire for you, yes, is to be happy, but he, he's like, hey, I didn't give you this little gift of happiness. No, no, I want to give you this big gift of joy that exceeds that because, hey, I, I want to remind you that joy, it supersedes happiness. It's the upgrade. And see, joy is sustainable. You can implant into your life, and, and it will carry out in every aspect of your life. So you, can, you can't buy joy. You can buy happiness, but guess what? It doesn't last. See, I'm not naive to the fact that some of you this Christmas season aren't going to have that hall, Hallmark Christmas season, right? It's not going to be enjoyable. Some of you, for the first time this Christmas season, are going to experience loneliness. You may have lost a parent, a child, a friend. Some of you are going to face divorce, and you're not going to know because you're not going to ever spend your Christmas with your kids. Some of you are going to pick up that phone call this week, and cancer is going to come knocking on your door. I'm not naive to the fact that life hits at the most inopportune times. That's why we can't just base our life off happiness, y'all. This Christmas season won't last through happiness. It's got to be built upon joy. But before I get going, we got to understand what joy is. What is joy? I like participation. What is joy? I'll help you out. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. How do you know? Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Read that. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Question, who produces this kind of fruit? Who? So the Holy Spirit produces what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So the Holy Spirit is supposed to get in your life and produce practical fruit, right? Like you don't just get saved to come here on a Sunday. 
enjoy the worship, get your fill of happiness or emotion, leave here unchanged, six days out of the week doing your own thing to come crawling back here on a Sunday morning just to, just to repeat the process. No way. No way. You get saved. You, you accept gifts of salvation. The Holy Spirit starts to get in you and actually changes your life. You see, I grew up in church for the majority of my life, and verses like this, and some of you might know what I'm talking about, become so cliche. You're just like, I know the Holy Spirit produces love, joy, peace. You just kind of brush by, right? It's great. It's in the Bible. But God brought me back. He's like, hey, read that again, Adrian. He said, hey, I gave you the Holy Spirit that lives within you to produce practical love. What are you talking about practical love? I mean the love during the season. That means, hey, you can go out of your way to someone that you might loathe, hate. I don't like using that word. Dislike. They might have stabbed you in the back. But man, it's not of you. It's supernatural. It's a, pro it's a product of the Holy Spirit. You go and show them love. The Holy Spirit gets in you and gives you that practical peace. That means, hey, I'm making this decision in life and people think I'm crazy. But there's just something about the Holy Spirit is leading me here. I know that he's got it. The Holy Spirit gets in you and produces practical joy. That your happiness, yeah, it goes up and down. But man, you say, I, God, you got it. I trust you. I'll be okay. See, that's what the Holy Spirit does. And we're talking about joy, which is the fruit of the Spirit. And, and you have to understand where it comes from. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And see, joy isn't just a typical fruit of the Spirit. It's powerful. The joy of the Lord is our the joy of the Lord is our Nehemiah 8.10. So literally God is saying, hey, if you're going to make it through each day, if you're going to need my strength, you've got to understand that joy is the fuel that powers your strength. See, many of us are so drained. We don't have fuel from day to day. We're trying to sustain our own self, right? You're drained in your work week. You're drained in your marriage, in your finances, in your parenting. You're drained in your business or your busyness. preaching to myself, y'all. But God said, hey, I gave you the fuel, and if it, it's a lasting fuel, it will sustain you. That's joy, because the joy of the Lord is my strength. So joy, it's incredibly powerful. And I think a lot of us are hanging on the idea of joy, but we've replaced it for happiness. Man. Hey, hey if you're ready to dig in, just say, I'm ready. All right, let's go. John chapter 15, verse 11 John chapter 15 is, is really an anchor chapter for my own life. Um, I reflect on it a lot, and I felt like God was drawing some truth out of this. And I want to give you some practical things that you could take away and apply into your life regarding joy. I'm a practical guy. Aren't we all practical people? We want to know how to get this going, right? So read with me. John chapter 15, verse 11. It says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy, say joy, Say joy like you mean it. Joy. May be in you. That your joy, say joy, joy, may be full. You see, in other translations it says to be made complete or to overflow. See, God didn't say, hey, I want to give you my happiness. Because we already determined happiness comes and goes. It's temporary, right? He said, no. When life brings you things you can't control, you can't sustain through happiness. I want to implant my joy in you. Why? Because it will cause you to overflow with joy. Joyful. He wants to make you joyful. So in fact, he says, hey, I got something better for you. I got something that will help you sustain when the storms start coming. That's my joy. I have something that will make you smile. Some of y'all need to smile. When everything is broken, that's, that's my joy. Hey, all of your friends, your family, people who said they could support you, when they're gone and it's just you, you still stand there with joy. You're okay. You're constant. Why? Because God said, hey, I want to give you my joy. Implant it in your heart. Let it overflow in you. Produce something that is lasting. Do you guys want that type of joy? You're going to need it if you're going to face a holiday season or a Christmas season that is, is less than picture perfect. So I looked up the definition of joy and was actually extremely disappointed with it. The definition of joy, if you Google it, it says what? It's a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. 
man, that's lame. You know why? Because that is not enough. That type of joy is not enough for me to hang on when life gets hard. Can you relate? A feeling of great pleasure and happiness is not enough to sustain when things come knocking on your door. So I begin to do some research through scripture and the Holy Spirit's like, hey, look at my example of joy. And so he brought me to Job, right? You guys know the story of Job. Job lost everything. He lost his kids, his fortunes. Man, his, his friends said, hey, curse God. He said, curse God. He lost everything, man. This guy, do you think he was feeling great pleasure or happiness? No, he just lost everything. That's not, that's not happiness. That's joy. In fact, I believe he, he was standing there losing everything, tears running down his face. He said something maybe like, the Lord gives and Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Where do you get that? What about Jesus, the example of Jesus? Hebrews 12, 2, man, read this. This is crazy. It hit me. Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, say joy, that was set before him, endured the cross. Wait, Adrian, are you saying, are you saying that the thing that kept Jesus on the cross for me was joy? That's what the writer of Hebrews says. All right, like, imagine that, Jesus on the cross. I'm all man, and this is painful. I am dying, and I see Adrian and all of his insecurities and all of his faults and everything, and, and insert your name. But you know what? I'm going to stay here. Why? I'm going to stay here and endure the cross. Why? Because of the joy that was set before me. The cross was not a place of great pleasure or happiness. It was a place of death and shame. Why, why am I bringing up these examples? Because I believe a lot of us have believed the lie. We believe that, hey, our life circumstances, since they're not right, we can't have joy. We can't have joy. But man, I'm here to change the narrative. Hey, God said, hey, I'm the only one who can give you joy, but not just a little bit. I want you to make you joyful. Joyful. Exceeding full of joy, especially in the middle of a hard season. So this must mean we have the wrong definition of joy. And follow me quick because I'm going to I'm gonna talk real fast. I didn't even take pre-workout today, y'all. You're lucky. <laughs> So joy must mean that it's a supernatural delight in the person, the purpose, the plan, the placement, the provision, and people of God. Whoa. That's practical. What does that mean? Let's go on to my first point. It's, you will be joyful as you discover that joy isn't a feeling. Joy is a heart posture. It means I don't feel this. It's where I have my eyes fixed. Well, what do you mean? See, keeping our eyes fixed on a steady thing is not natural to us. Because why? We're like squirrels left and right. At least I am, right? I got nine million things on my plate. And I will look at nine million things on my plate. Can you relate? But having a fixed perspective, a heart posture after God says, hey, I see all of these things happening and I can't control that. But man, I'm steady looking to you. My perspective is on you. And see, that's only worked in by the Holy Spirit, y'all. See, when we spend time with God, when we pray, when we come into his house and worship and participate in worship, participate, not just receive. I mean, we're giving a gift to God. We're participating, right? We're changing the atmosphere. When you apply his principles into your situations, when you continue to press on through your trials and grow in them, man, joy becomes something that the Holy Spirit begins to produce and work in your life. It becomes something that is not natural. It becomes a supernatural delight in knowing this. God, God is good. His purposes are coming to pass. He has a specific plan for my life. That I'm placed right where I need to be. And if I'm off course, man, his grace is so good, it'll bring me right back. Hey, everything I need will be provided when I need it. And guess this is the best part. He's going to surround me with people to 
to support me in community and, com- uh, and accountability and encourage me, especially when I need it. Right? See, joy is having a fixed perspective on Jesus. You can't have joy if your focus is always shifting. Some of you are so busy in this season, you can't even see straight. It's so easy during the holidays to get caught up with shopping, making it into the next event, insert your list. But I'm here to ask you, where is your, where's your heart fixed? What's the perspective of your life? And see, there's nothing wrong with happiness. There's nothing wrong with celebrating with friends and all that. But guess what? What we focus on, what we fix our obsessions on, whatever gives us feeling of great pleasure and happiness, once that's gone, so your focus shifts. So that's why it's so important that God says, hey, you, you have to have a heart posture after me. Why? Why is it so important? Because Revelation 1.8 tells us, hey, he alone is the Alpha, the Omega. He is the one who is, who was, and is to come, right? Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ was the same what? Yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3.6 says, for I, the Lord, do not change. So therefore, fix your perspective on someone who's never going to move. God said, hey, I'm here for you. I was here for you yesterday. I was here for you today. I'm here for you in the moment. And you don't have to worry about eternity. I'll be there. So that's why it's so important that you posture your heart after God. So practically speaking, what is, what is posturing your heart after God? It means you adopted an attitude of God's got it and I trust him. Say that with me. God's got it and I trust him. Say it like you mean it. God's got it and I trust him. So that means... When my spouse is talking divorce, God's got it, and I trust him. When my kids are acting foolish, God's got it, and I trust him. That means when I bury a child or a parent, and I've been praying for their healing, God, you got it, and I trust you. Does that hit with someone today? You have to adopt this posture and this attitude that, God, you've got it. I know things feel very uncomfortable. I know things are just, man, it's draining. But you got it, and I trust you. See, that's the only way you can stay on the cross. That's the only way you can lose everything and say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Why? Because you have an anchor for your soul. It's dropped. The waves come. You're not moving. You're not going anywhere. You've got the attitude, God, you got it. And I trust you. So let's go to the next one. Once you have this heart posture, right? Once you've adopted this attitude that, hey, God, you got it, and I trust you, you begin to realize that you become joyful as you discover that joy only comes from Jesus. He's the source. He's the source to everything. Back up a couple of verses. John chapter 15, verse 4 through 5. He says, abide in me, say abide, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides, say abides, in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide, say abide, in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Circle, underline, tattoo, screenshot, whatever you need to do, that word abide is crucial to your livelihood. In fact, Jesus says that four times in the matter of two verses. He's trying to get a point across to you. See, that word abide in Hebrews is literally translated to remain, to stay. Stay a while, tarry, stay connected, don't go anywhere. And why is that so important? Because God's saying, hey, if you're going to do anything that lasts in this life, you're going to have to understand that I'm the source of everything. Hey, if you're going to want to bear fruit, if you want to be fruitful, if you're going to want to be joyful, since we, di- we discover that joy is the fruit of the Spirit, if you want that, you're going to understand that I alone can give that. I am the source. See, a lot of us are walking around here like we're the source of everything. Right? 
Adrian, that's kind of offensive. I work hard. I didn't say you did. I work hard too. I do good things. Got it. Noted. But I'm saying you can't do anything that lasts, that was never meant to last. You were never meant to be a source that sustains. Let me prove it. Man, you start a diet. Oh, he went there. I'm that guy. I'm, got, I'm not going to look at you all in the eyes. I'm just going to look at the back. He started a diet. He started a fitness routine. Ed, put your hand down. <laughs> and man, you tried in your own willpower. Two days later, you quit. You quit. All right, I'll move on from that one. Hey, you might say, hey, I'm trying to do this or do that. I'm trying to sustain happiness through filling it with things, time. You run out of money. Look, these things were never meant to last. You were never meant to be a sustaining source. But God's here in your corner and saying, hey, if you just tag me in, I can do that for you. It's not even hard for me. In fact, if you tag me in, I can promise you it will last forever. So, <laughs> that's good. That was good for me. See, Jesus is saying, hey, I created you to be a vehicle of delivery, a delivery vehicle. Like you, you get on Amazon Prime, you start delivering, it comes into your, your door and it, it drops happiness, right? You're that Amazon Prime truck. God said, hey. Well, some of you are. I don't. Okay. He's saying, hey, look, I, I created you so I could put my spirit in you. So that you could deliver practical fruit to my people. And so maybe they could eat of your fruit. And maybe they could actually experience my love, my joy, my peace. You see, he, he said, hey, I want to do, I want to shift the atmosphere of your city, of your neighborhoods. I want to do that through you. So you're not the source. I'm the source. So let's don't get this thing twisted. If you're going to do anything that lasts, you're going to have to stay connected to me. You're going to have to learn to abide you're going to have to stay a while. Hey, how many of you plant things? How many of you have grown something by planting a seed? The next day you come along, you pick that seed up off the ground. The next day, you go plant it again. And the next day after that, you go pick it up off the ground. How many of you actually grown something? Thank you, because you're, oh man, someone raised their hand. That was a bad example. No, you can't grow an apple tree by picking it up out of the ground every day and planting it. Why? You can't bear fruit unless you're grounded, unless you're planted. As long as you can't bear fruit unless you stay connected to the source. So if you want to, if you want to grow, if you want to overflow with joy, you're going to have to stay a while. You're going to have to endure those tough times and learn what exceeding joy means through these things. Right? Hey. You're going to have to stay disciplined. We don't like that word. You're going to have to stay consistent, staying connected with him if you're going to bear fruit. See, God's saying, hey, hey, don't worry. Don't worry about you messed up. Yeah, I, I get it. You messed up. That's fine. Pick yourself back up. You struggle with sin? Yeah, confess your sins to one another. Hold each other accountable. Stay in the game. You don't know what tomorrow's outcome? Don't worry about tomorrow's outcome. I, I'm the one who dictates that. That's not in your control. Hey, you don't have to worry about salvation. I already paid for it. So please enjoy this life on earth to a fullness, to abundance. Exceed with joy. I've already paid for it. I sent my son to die for you. Please, would you just smile and would you just stay connected to me and just enjoy this life of abundance? Let's go. But, but you know, I feel like he pays for this five-course meal and we, we just settle for the mints and water. Not even the Diet Coke. Right? He's saying, no, 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 please, just experience my fullness, my joy, my abundant life. But you got to stay connected to me. And so what does that mean practically? That means read your Bible, y'all. Well, Adrian, that's, that's so easy. Yeah. We don't need to make things hard. Read your Bible. 
Spend time in his presence. What we do on a Sunday, you can take everywhere. Right? You don't have to wait for a Sunday. No, he says, hey, read your Bible. Read your Bible. Let it get in you. Digest it. Why, 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 why? Because it's hard to be joyful when you're hungry. Oh, you know where I'm going. It's hard to be joyful when your spirit man is hungry. And some of you are walking around here starving your spirit man. You're not in the Word. You're not in His presence. You have no idea what abiding or staying connected or persevering through a time of, uh, of hardship is. How do you expect to bear fruit? How do you expect to have this joyfulness, especially through the season of life? Some of you walk around here, mate. This is just the way I am. My face says it all. <laughs> this is just the way I am. Man, can I say to you, this is going to be harsh, but you are so malnourished spiritually that you think that's normal. No, because when I read scripture, it says uh, the Holy Spirit produces these kind of fruits, these practical fruits. So that means when you, your starving, hangry person, is superseded by the Holy Spirit, you actually display the characters of God. Does it make sense to you? So he's saying, hey, you can't do anything without me because I'm the source. And you're going to have to read your word and learn to abide. Check out Jeremiah 15, 16. It says, when I discovered your words, I devoured them. I ate them. I ate them. Why? Because my spirit is hungry. It gets in me. It digests. And then it, it's so great. It says, because they are my joy and my heart's delight. I love how scripture does that. He proves the point, and I didn't even have to. Hey, if you read the word of God, it will become joy within you. It will become your delight. And see, hey, joy only comes from Jesus. He's the source. So what am I saying on this point? I'm saying, hey, if you would stay, if you would posture your heart after God and then create a rhythm in your life that says, hey, I'm going to stay connected. I'm not moving. I want everything you have, and then I, I need to have something that's lasting. I need to learn to stay connected with you. Guess what? You start to bear this fruit that's called joy. You get to exceed with joyfulness through those hard times. But what's the best part about a tree that bears fruit? An apple tree doesn't produce fruit for its own well-being. The apple tree doesn't eat itself. It's for the enjoyment of others. I already said it earlier. Say, hey, if, if you would posture your heart after me, if you would stay connected to me, I will produce fruit in you. I will produce this joy in you. And someone who's going through a season, someone who doesn't know Christ, will pick of that and, and figure out that, man, this joy is lasting. Maybe I'm missing out on life. Maybe I'm missing out on something. And that's your opportunity to share the gospel. Man. So that brings me to my final point, and I've got to wrap this up. I've got a lot to say, but, man, I could be here all day. Joy is an outcome. It's an outcome of the things you do as you get to know Jesus, as you get to know him, y'all. Listen to this analogy. The secret of living is joy. The secret to joy is bearing fruit. The secret to bearing fruit is abiding the secret to abiding is obeying. The secret to obeying is loving. The secret to loving is knowing. Knowing who? Jesus. Adrian, you're saying literally that everything over and over, I am. I'm just trying to get it in the heart. I'm trying to get it in the heart. Why? Because if your heart's fixed on him, if your posture's on him, you stay connected you learn to know him, you experience joy, you experience life. See, because once you get to know Jesus, once you get to know him through experiencing him, like if you've ever needed a faithful God, he places a circumstances in your life that he gets to portray his attribute of faithfulness. Now you know him as faithful. You ever needed a God that was patient with you? Man, you messed up over and over and again. And you, you came to the altar and repented and you felt his love and kindness and his patience. Now you know him through experiencing him as a patient father, a loving God. 
And see, once you get to know him through this, it'll help you love him. And once you love him, you'll start obeying him. You will start obeying him, y'all. Once you start obeying, you start abiding. You start staying connected. Once you're connected, you start bearing fruit. Once you start bearing fruit, you got a ton of joy. But hey, guys, that's an outcome of knowing Jesus. That's an outcome of knowing Jesus. See, if you're going to make it through this Christmas season, if you're going to go beyond this Christmas season when 22 hits and, and life hits you on January 1st, you're going to have to know that it's not happiness that I'm after, it's joy. And that only comes from God. That only comes from Jesus. But who is this Jesus? <sighs> who is Jesus? Luke 2, 8 through 11. That night, there were shepherds staying in the field nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. Picture that. The Lord's glory is surrounding them. And they were terrified. But the angel said, hey, hey, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news, not sad news. Good news. Good news that will bring you great joy. Say joy. joy. To all people. What's that good news? The Savior. The Messiah. The Lord. Jesus was born why is that important, man? Because he left his position on earth, came to us as a baby, grew up as a man, gave joy away, experienced joy. He was faced with momentary times of unhappiness, yes. Discouragement, yes. Because we face that in life. But man, he stood there on the cross. And he paid it all. He thought of you. He thought of your drug abuse. He thought of your incarceration. He thought of your financial issues. He thought of your infidelities. He thought of all of your insecurities and bored on that cross. He said, why? Because of joy that, I was, that was placed before me. It's keeping me here. So I want to spend eternity with them. And that's a gift that is free. You don't have to buy that this Christmas. That's Jesus. Would you stand with me? That gift of salvation is free to you. And for some of you, there might be someone in this room that never has experienced a life of joyfulness. So you can, you can go around this life doing exactly what you did, and you'll get the same exact outcome. But Jesus gave you a gift of salvation. He wants you to be joyful this Christmas season and to exceed that through a lifetime. And if you've never experienced that, I want to offer that to you, and so does he. So every head bowed and every eye closed. If you've never accepted the gift of salvation, I want to personally pray for you, and so does my prayer team. Would you raise your hand? Would you raise your hand? Yes, thank you. Yes, praise God. If that's you and you're like, I, God, I need to continue to serve you, and, and you know, my, the posture of my heart has kind of been off, but I want to rededicate myself to you. I want to fix my perspective on you. I've been chasing happiness and thinking it was joy. But guess what? Everything lets me down. If that's you, would you raise your hand? All around the room. So I would ask you, man, don't leave here unchanged. Don't go through the, the religious uh, 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 act of just repeating the same process. If you want practical things to change in your life, you're going to have to do something different. And I, this ministry team here, we're going to pray over you. We want you to leave changed. We want to support you. So step out as you feel led. But I'm just going to pray, God, thank you. Thank you that you sent your son to die for us. Thank you that this Christmas season is truly about you. Why? Because you came to save us. You came to bring us joy. And Lord, a lot of us 
We've been chasing joy and replacing it with happiness. God, renew an intimacy all around this church. In everyone's life, God, would you just would you give them a fixed perspective on you? Lord, would the people here at Journey Church and those who are watching, Lord, would something spark in them, Lord, that they would stay connected to you? That they would stop trying to be the source. And Lord, would people come to know you this Christmas season? Why? Because we're bearing your name. We're bearing your fruit, Lord. So, Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us. And, Lord, may this word not go and fall on deaf ears, but, Lord, may this word just be cultivated. Would it change people? Would it change their lives? That it actually puts action to it, Lord, that you would create a relationship, a deep relationship with your people. Because that's all you want. This Christmas, all you want is their attention, the relationship with you. And everything else is second. So, Father, we commit our day to you, the service to you, our week to you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ma'am, don't, don't leave here without getting the help and care that you need. If you need prayer, this prayer team will stay up here and, and, uh, and they'll help you. Okay? Don't leave here unchanged, y'all. Apply these things into your life. If you don't know what I'm talking about, man, come find me. Come find one of the pastors. Come find someone that you can be accountable today. All right? Because if you're going to make it through this Christmas, you're going to have to do something that's different. Right? Amen. Well, guys, take this. Spread it to the world. Man, we want to see our city uh, transform. So you're going to have to apply what you've learned here today. Okay? Thank you all. Thank you all for coming.